recently I've been upgrading this small hybrid Condia Dali milling machine and fitting a coolant system to it. And in this video, I'll take you through how easy it is to build an auxiliary coolant system like this. He says, I was going to move it with my foot, but that didn't work, did it? Um, in a few hours work, just with a bit of plywood, a plastic box, and a low-cost centrifugal pump. Um, this milling machine was my sort of uh, non- production machine. I had a bigger manual mill in this corner, but because my work type has changed, I've sold that machine now. I've made a bit more space. I love having a bit of room to breathe. I'm a bit of a minimalist. One manual mill is enough for what I'm doing, and um, but it didn't have uh, a nicely fitted coolant system, so I thought I'd just quickly put together a little auxiliary coolant tank. It used to have a coolant pump in the base of the machine, but I never liked that system because it gets stale tramp oil in there. It's difficult to clean out, difficult to drain out, difficult to maintain, and uh, access is horrible. So I'd rather have a little mobile unit. I can wheel it on casters, not with one hand, as I'm finding out. There we are, it's tucked right out the way there. If I need to walk around the back of the machine, I can wheel it out very easily. This is a better solution. I'll take you through how easy it is to quickly build a little coolant system like this. All right, well, let's start with the design and construction of this coolant tank. So logically, you start off with the plastic box. And this is a fairly small one for this situation. You know, there's hundreds of different designs. So you select the plastic box that is the size you want. Um, they're usually made out of polypropylene, sometimes polyethylene. Um, and either of those materials is ideal for holding coolant long term. So if you start off with the box, then you can measure up the different dimensions of the box and design how you would make a plywood container for that box. So it can just snugly fit inside it. Now this gives you the best of both worlds because the plastic box obviously gives you a waterproof container to hold the coolant long term and the plywood outer gives you the strength that you need. It doesn't need to be made of steel or metal. It can just be made out of plywood. You can glue it together with woodworking glue, put a few screws in it very quickly, cheaply and simply. So all you do is get some 5 8 or 3 quarter inch plywood, you know, 17, 18 millimeter thick. It's cheap and easy to get. Screw it together. I put some heavier timber on the ends to take the casters at that height there. So it's this has sort of developed this design over the years. This is about the third or fourth one that I've built and it's a very practical and simple shape. So you've got the liner, the plastic box, you've got the plywood outer, then you can, depending on the design of your box, make a lid that could be made out of steel or aluminium, but again I just used plywood. And you can buy that self-priming acrylic paint, you know, fence paint, that type of thing. Just get a grey that you want, slop on a couple of coats. So this is the lid, and uh, drops in there, and your coolant pump. drops in the cutout hole, so you just cut out a couple of holes with the jigsaw. You might have another lid so that you can open it and get in there and just clean out the uh, bottom of the tray every couple of years. Or if you want to uh, put a clean dry cloth on the surface, that will pick up any tramp 
uh, lubricating oil that's floating on the surface and when it's all fully soaked into the cloth you can just pull the cloth or the rag out and throw that in the bin. Um, so there you have it, very quick and easy, just a few hours work to design and build a very simple coolant tank. Here's a couple of earlier versions that I've built of these coolant tanks. This was one of my first ones and I just used a couple of 20 litre containers joined together uh, with a couple of plumbing fittings and a bit of rubber hose down in there. Um, it's got a, a wire mesh uh, filter just to keep out the worst of the uh, chips that might uh, end up in the coolant tank and that will settle in that first tank and the second tank will be a lot cleaner. Um, this is a later version of the design. You know, it's, obviously it's so handy because you can just wheel them around um, to service them, to pull them out, to uh, fill them up or to clean them out or to take them outside and tip them out. And um, so here we have a uh, uh, another uh, filter. What I tend to do is put a cloth or a rag or a microfiber cloth there on top of the filter that um, helps to filter out uh, small particles that you don't want in the coolant and then every few months you can just bundle that up and bin it, put a new one in. So this is a bit bigger tank with a bigger motor uh, so I can really have high pressure flood cooling for when I'm doing uh, more uh, swath control intensive machining operations. Here's a sketch showing the construction of it. So you can see the base comes right to the outside and that way the uh, box container is sitting on top of it. So they're quite he it's quite heavy the coolant tank and it's probably a good idea to have the base uh, fully on the bottom rather than the sides on the base. Um, although, you know, if you're using uh, woodworking PVA type glue and a few screws, it's going to be massively strong. But I suppose in theory it's better to have the base full size like that. So anyway, that's the construction design of this container. Well, most of the connections are pretty self-explanatory, but let's just go through it quickly. So I've just got a single phase connection here to a switchable um, multi-board. It's a noisy little motor, isn't it? That'll teach me for being cheap. I guess you could get those motors in the States for 50 to 100 US dollars here in New Zealand. I think it was about 150 New Zealand dollars. So it's probably pretty junky, but it still seems to work okay. So I've got that switching on and off there in that little multi-outlet board. Um, a hose with a, with a couple of Jubilee clips. I just used one of these magnetic uh, type of uh, hose attachments. You know the type. What's it called? Multi-lock, uni-lock. There's different brands. The, the original brand name escapes me at the moment um, for the uh, pressure feed system and a simple drain system. I've got a little uh, filter there and it just drains away with a bit of um, half inch hose into the tank. Now I could put a filter in here but I'm only going to be using it for... Um, sort of low volume, small scale, manual work. i uh, just put a little Jubilee clip on there so it stays together. Um, I don't know that I need to bother with a filter in this situation. On my other machines you've probably seen I've got filters. This is just going to be for manual drilling and a small amount of milling and so on. Um, I'm not going to be generating a lot of swarf. Probably that uh, little filter there will be adequate. Well, don't copy my exact design. This was an early type of filter. It's a bit too much work really. You can just roll it up out of a piece of uh, insect mesh that you can buy from your hardware store. You know the type made out of aluminium or soft stainless steel is it? Cheapest chips. 
cut a piece off and roll it up that's just as good uh, just a note for your outlet hose coming out there you want to set it so that it continually goes downhill without any loops so I don't know if I can show that very easily but see how I've got that continually falling down if, if you've got it looping down low and then coming back up again you'll get an airlock in it and often that will cause a blockage and it won't drain away and you'll think that your filter's blocked up but all it really is is that there's an airlock in your outlet pipe your outlet hose it's a good idea to put an extension tube on your snap lock coolant nozzle for two reasons one is that it gets the whole snap lock uh, nozzle and system further out the way so it gives you more clearance and it also allows you to use a smaller flow rate and a smaller diameter flow of coolant and I want to explain why that's a good idea because um, I know some of you will probably argue well just turn on a big flood of coolant and be done with it um, what I found over the years is that and for manual milling where you don't have an enclosure and you don't want to be sprayed with coolant and you don't want it dripping all over the floor it's better to have a very small flow rate you don't need much coolant to lubricate the cutting action and to cool the cutting action and even to wash away chips in most situations that's different from a CNC where you've got an enclosure you can turn on a heap of coolant and blast away the chips and close the doors and not have to worry about it for manual machining I think it's really worth considering having a very narrow stream of coolant the other thing to consider is each time you switch the machine on coolant sprays everywhere and if you have too much it runs off the vise, drips onto your covers, drips onto the floor, fills up your coolant tray, and um, not much of it actually gets back into the tank. You know, the average job might be a five minute machining operation. You might use half a liter of coolant or a liter of coolant. Let's talk US measures, say a pint or two pints of coolant. Most of that's going to end up sitting on the table and the vise and and on the coolant tray and and um, not much is going to get back into the tank and uh, every time you do that you're going to lose another it's going to evaporate away over the next week or two then you do the next job you'll lose another pint or two and you'll be topping up your coolant tank all the time it's just the way it is for uh, these sort of short jobs on a manual machine so I would advocate having a very small flow so that you contain the amount of coolant. It just drops down into the table and drains away. Um, occasionally you'll need a flood of coolant to cool down a big cutter or a big drill. But most of the time a small flow is better. You'll waste a lot less coolant. You'll make a lot less mess. So that sort of leads on to my point of why I've got a separate coolant tank fed directly from the table and then why I'm not using the big collection tray under the machine because I've found over the years that for most small jobs you hardly get any draining back down into the tank inside the machine. Most of it ends up spraying everywhere all over you all over the floor all over the vice um, and you only get a small amount getting back into the tank uh, before you finish the job and then what's sitting everywhere on the surface evaporates away and you're just using up your coolant um, so this time I thought well I won't have flood coolant I'll have a small amount of coolant that drains directly out of the table because that coolant down there, you can see it there starting to build up on this job because it's a couple of hours work, is only just starting to get into the base tank anyway. Um, and uh, I just think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it on this machine uh, without having a base tank in use. I'll probably have to 
clean it out. Every, I, I, actually, I could seal those little uh, filter uh, uh, drain holes there with some silicon and a, a plate. Um, and Or I could just drain out the tank, you know, full of stale tramp oil every uh, couple of years and just chuck it out. Anyway, that's my plan on this machine to have an ancillary coolant tank and just a small amount of coolant directly feeding into it. So that's the basic hookup. Just a few hours work, cheap and cheerful. Um, but certain types of work, you know, when you're machining tool steel and you're deep drilling and so on, and working with high speed steel cutters, or you want a flood cleaner, small uh, tanks and carbide end mill, um, there are situations where I just like to have flood coolant. If you found something useful in this video, please like and subscribe, have a look at my playlists. There's hundreds of videos on all sorts of engineering shop subjects.